I'm going to say um, again, Salam Aleikum, um, Shalom Aleichem. Uh, may peace be upon all of you and all of us. Uh, we, we want to welcome um, our friends uh, tonight who are here to uh, finish the day's fast um, as part of Ramadan um, and to enjoy an iftar uh, meal with us. I'm Rabbi Daniel Graber. Uh, we want to say uh, to, um, uh, to people who are Jewish in the community, we, we want to say Chag Sameach, um, which means a happy holiday, um, as we celebrate the holiday of Shavuot. Um, and the, we are going to be, I'm going to talk for one moment about the program for tonight, um, and then uh, we'll continue um, with some teaching from my friend and colleague, Imam Mulid Ali. Uh, and the program for tonight, we're going to hear some teaching first between now and 826. There will be no going over. <laughs> because our friends have been fasting all day, and so we want to honor them um, by finishing, I would say, at 8.24 in 30 seconds. Uh, and at, right at that time, we will go outside and we, there will be um, some water and some dates and other things, uh, and we can um, enjoy a break the fast uh, together. Um, that will last just a, a few minutes after which um, our friends from the mosques will uh, go into the library um, where we have uh, set it up, um, I, I think in a way that, um, that can be used for the evening prayers. Um, friends from Bethel are welcome to come to the sanctuary. We have our evening prayers for, uh, for Shavuot. Uh, each of these we've timed out will be about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then we will all uh, retire to the social hall and we'll enjoy um, a bigger meal uh, together. Um, after which uh, I have explained to our friends, we have a lot of learning that's going to go on tonight. Um, I wanna say thank you to Rabbi Sager in advance uh, who will be uh, beginning our learning uh, probably around 9.45 or so um, to 10.45. We'll take a 15 minute break. Uh, rabbi Larry Bach, who is the rabbi of Judea Reform Synagogue, will be offering a shiur um, from 11 until uh, about midnight. And if anybody is still awake and still interested, uh, I will offer some teaching at about 12.15 um, until whatever hour we have the time, uh, we have the strength for. Uh, so I want to, hello. Um, and I'll take a moment to say welcome to the Reverend Katie Crow, uh, my friend and colleague from uh, Trinity Avenue Presbyterian Church. It's great to have you. Um, I asked Imam Muli to, to speak about revelation. Um, today is a day, Shavuot is a day that the Jewish people celebrate the receiving of the Torah, the gift of the Torah from God. Um, revelation takes, has something that it takes for granted, which is that in the Jewish tradition, God wants to communicate with the Jewish people and wants to communicate with human beings. If God was uninterested, then there would be no purpose for a revelation whatsoever. And we begin, and so the assumption is that God cares for the Jewish people and that God cares for all of humanity and, and wants to communicate. But the fundamental question is, how does that happen? How does an infinite God who is beyond human form, beyond physical letters, beyond human speech, make known God's will in a material world? And I like to say I had a teacher once who said that the more answers there are for a question, the more it means that nobody really knows. <laughs> and there are many, many answers for that question in the Jewish tradition um, because it's one of those questions that in some ways can't be answered. I really believe that um, we can learn from each other and Imam Olid is, uh, we have enjoyed coffee and enjoy getting to know each other. Um, I also want to wish him a mazel tov um, because he is recently married just a few weeks ago. Um, so we say congratulations to you, mazel tov. And he is a man of deep scholarship and wonderful learning. And it's a pleasure 
to invite him to share with us some teaching about the idea of revelation in the Muslim tradition. Imam Mulid. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful. Uh, first of all, I would like to say, Assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you all. And it's uh, indeed my pleasure to be here today with all of you. I congratulate all of you for this holiday. Uh, in the Quran, uh, we acknowledge the revelation of Torah that when God decided to, re to reveal the Torah to Musa, in the Arabic we say Musa, in the English it says Moses, on the mountain of Sinai. It's called Tur Sinai in the Quran. It is, I think, appropriate time for us to look at the revelation from different aspects, from the perspective of uh, Judaism and also from Islamic uh, perspective. Uh, I think this is a fascinating coincidence that we're celebrating the revelation of Torah at the same time we're celebrating the month of Ramadan. And this is the month that was revealed the Quran. And exactly the night of the 27th of the month of Ramadan, which will come in about three weeks. So the Quran talks about the revelation of the Quran in the month of Ramadan in a specific way. There is one chapter in the Quran that I would like to quote in the beginning. So God says in the Quran, the Quran which enables the, real the realization of the truth and delineates the difference between the right and the wrong has been revealed in the month of Ramadan. So speaking about tanzil, which is the revelation, uh, the word tanzil, it comes from the word nazala, the root word for this uh, concept of tanzil comes from nazala, which means uh, the coming down or the descending of the revelation from a high place to a lower place. And this is the exact nature of this revelation because in Islam, we believe that Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, received the revelation uh, in Mecca. That was the sixth century AD. And that was a critical time, as the historians tell us. That was a time that people were seeking guidance. That was a time that uh, the Europeans were experiencing a dark age. And also in the Indian civilization, there was another term which is synonymous to a dark age. It's, they call it Kali Yuga, which is like a dark age, uh, which is the end of a cycle. And everybody was expecting someone to come to bring a revelation that will guide the humanity. So we believe that Prophet Muhammad's uh, revelation was not a coincidence, but it was a, an intended purpose and revelation that came in the right time to the right person and in the right place. Uh, the revelation of the Quran took two stages. Uh, the first stage was the revelation of the Quran from the preserved tablet which is in the seven heavens, to the lowest heaven, which is the sky. That is the first stage of the revelation. And that took place in the 27th of the month of Ramadan, the 27th night of the month of Ramadan. And that night is a special night for the Muslims. We celebrate, we stand up for the whole night, as you do, uh, like tonight. It's gonna come in three weeks, as I said. So that revelation took place in the 27th of the month of Ramadan. That's the first stage of the revelation from the seven heavens to the lowest heaven. And then also the second revelation took place in the month of Ramadan. And that was also in the 27th of the month of Ramadan. It came from the lowest heaven through Jibril or Gibrael to Prophet Muhammad. And that was also in the month of Ramadan. And the first revelation that came down was the beginning of Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, which means read in the name of your Lord. That was the first revelation that came down. 
And reading here doesn't just mean reading books, but to read with your mind, with your heart, to look at the universe, to look at the creation of God, and to contemplate. That was the first revelation that Muhammad, peace be upon him, received. And also, God speaks about how this, the second revelation took into his state. It took about 23 years, and God says, we separated the Quran into chapters, completing one another so that you may recite to the people over a prolonged period of time, giving them the chance to digest it. So it took 23 years to give the people a time to internalize and digest the message of the Quran. Speaking about the, this message of the Quran, if you read the Quran, it is very clear that the Quran acknowledges the, the prophecy of Prophet Musa or Moses and Jesus and all the previous messengers. We also believe that the Quran came to complete the previous revelations. Uh, there is a, a verse in the Quran in which Prophet Muhammad declares that he is not innovator, that he is not bringing a new revelation. He is basically bringing or completing the, the previous revelations. One of the verses in regards to this aspect of completing the previous revelations we find in chapter uh, 4, ayah 14, or verse 14, uh, God says, uh, all the people of the book, uh, to Jews and the Christians, there has come to you a messenger informing you of the truth in a period of suspension between messengers. The Prophet Muhammad came in a period of suspension between messengers that there was a civil war among the religious people and there was also chaos and bloodshed. So to restore the original faith of the mankind, God sent Prophet Muhammad. And also there is another verse which speaks to the, the unity of the religions of the prophets, that Prophet Musa or Moses and Jesus, Abraham and all the prophets they all came to convey one message, and that is that you worship God alone. The chapter 42, verse 14, God says, he has ordained for you of the single religion what he enjoined upon Noah, what he revealed to you, and what we enjoined upon Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, and that is to establish the religion and that you don't fall into separation or division therein. Meaning that this message of the Quran is to bring the unity, to bring that one single religion that God gave to Moses, Abraham, and Jesus, and all the previous uh, messengers. Speaking about the revelation of the Quran, there is one thing we need to keep in mind, and that is the Quran came in the Arabic language. And the Arabs, before the Qur'an, they were subservient to other uh, countries or other civilizations. They were subservient to the Persian civilization, the Roman civilization. They didn't have a leadership. They didn't have an important role to play. And even before the revelation of Qur'an, Mecca was an important place. It was not a recognizable city before the revelation of the Qur'an from the standpoint of the civilizations and the power they, they had at that time. But after the Quran came down, Prophet Muhammad brought this leadership of submitting to, to God. In the Arabs, they used to worship idols, and there was also another religion called uh, Sabi or Sabinism, which is worshiping the natural forces like the stars or the moons, that was also a religion that existed in the Arabian Peninsula. So Prophet Muhammad came to convey the message of submission to God, submission to Allah. There is one story I wanted to share with you, and this is the story of the first uh, migration to Abyssinia, known as Ethiopia. 
where Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, sent a, a group of his companions to Ethiopia because they couldn't practice Islam in Mecca. So they, they went to Ethiopia. And at that time, the king of Ethiopia, by the name Najashi or Najis, when those companions arrived in Ethiopia, he asked them, what do you have from the revelation of your prophet? And then one of the companions by the name Jafar recited the beginning of uh, the chapter of Maryam or Mary that explains the nature of Jesus and his birth from a Quranic perspective. So the, the king of Ethiopia, Najis, he became acquiescent to the message of Jafar at that time. And he asked, what was your situation before the revelation of the Quran? And Jafar described the situation of the Arabs before the Quran. And he said, O oh king, we were a people in a state of ignorance and immorality. We were worshipping idols and eating the flesh of dead animals. We were committing all sorts of sins and shameful deeds. We were also breaking the ties of kinship, treating guests badly, and the strong among us oppress the weak. We remained in this state until Allah sent from among us a prophet. His lineage, truthfulness, trustworthiness, and integrity were well known to us. He called us to worship God alone and to renounce the idols which we and our ancestors used to worship besides God. He ordered us to speak the truth, to honor our promises, to be kind to our relationship, to be helpful to our neighbors. He ordered us to avoid all forbidden acts. He prevented us from bloodshed, obscenities, lying, and false witness, stealing orphans' property, and slandering chaste women. He ordered us to worship Allah alone and not to worship anything with him. He ordered us to pray, to give charity, and fast in the month of Ramadan. Speaking of the month of Ramadan, for us as Muslims, this is the month that we re-emphasize the core teachings of Islam. Compassion, love, mercy, taking care of the needy people, helping the orphans. Those are the core teachings of Islam. And in the month of Ramadan, we re-emphasize these teachings. Uh, my respected friends and guests, there is no doubt that we all come from different backgrounds. We worship the same God, but we have different revelations. And the Quran itself acknowledges that, the diversity in the humanity. There is one message that the Quran offers to this diversity that we have, and that is, in the day of judgment, only God is responsible for whoever will enter the paradise, whoever will attain felicity, or whoever will attain damnation on the day of judgment. For us as a religious people in this earth, we need to work together in, com in, in pursuit of common interest because we have so many things in common. The greatest thing is that we worship one God. And that is sufficient for us to work together. As for our salvation, the Quran teaches us that when it comes to your personal relationship with God, it is a personal choice. So you work for your salvation with diligence. And thank you very much. And peace be upon to you all. Thank you. to propose, why don't you, you stand near the microphone, um, and what I want to share with you is that in the Jewish tradition, um, and I would say especially in our congregation, we believe that part of the way that God um, continues to speak in the world is through questions and answers, um, and through back and forth. And um, so I, I want to begin, if it's okay with you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, but uh, if it's okay, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions and maybe we'll have uh, a few questions from the community as well. Does that feel, is that oh, okay? Fine, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so one question that I have for you is, um, 
in the modern day, uh, how do you understand God's voice continuing to speak um, in, in the Muslim world, in, the, in a Muslim community? Um, how does God's voice continue to echo, uh, not just in previous times, but um, how do we discern that voice? Well, I know it's a, it's a very difficult question, but let me try to answer it. Okay? You know, in, in Islam, we believe that uh, the last revelation was given to Prophet Muhammad, and there will be no prophet after Prophet Muhammad. But we believe what's called the revival of the religion, that every hundred years, it's someone from the Muslim community would come up, and doesn't have to be one individual. It could be a group of people, it could be a community that would come together and they would revive God's message again in the community. So we believe that, you know, in, that there would be people amongst us, scholars, people who are dedicated to bringing the core teaching of Islam into the public, and those are the people who will be the role model, and those are the people who will revive the teachings of uh, Prophet Muhammad. Did I answer your question? You did. Tell me a little bit more about how how does one discern who, a, who an appropriate teacher is or who's doing a revival of the Quran uh, and a revival of the teachings as opposed to something not? Yeah. Well, again, that's, you know, in, in the Muslims, we have a diversity in the interpretations of the Quran. And, you know... With the Jews, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when we say that we have a, someone who is reviving the religion of Islam in the West, maybe that person is not recognizable in the, in the East. So it's always relative, right? It's always depending on the situation and the circumstances and, 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 and the person who is doing the revival, the place that he finds himself in. So we'd say that, for example, there could be a revival in in the Middle East, or there could be someone in India, or it could be someone maybe in, in the West. So all the Muslims don't agree upon individuals to be the, the, the ultimate uh, source for interpret, interpretations of the Quran. We believe that after the death of Prophet Muhammad, everybody is making their own efforts to come to the right understanding of the Quran. It could be right and it could be, it could be wrong. But the final source we go back to, if there is any uh, disagreements, or any difference of opinions, is, is the teachings of Prophet Muhammad. And there are some principles that we cannot deviate if we want to go back to that source. So I want to share with you, um, in the Jewish tradition, uh, one of the ideas, a, a rabbi can be called a mara de atra, uh, which is an Aramaic term, which means literally master of the place. Um, doesn't really mean master, but uh, but the idea is that a, a particular rabbi exercises religious authority, um, but to a particular community, and so there is this back and forth between a community may seek out a teacher, um, and uh, you know I'm, I'm sort of curious how did you become the teacher for your community, but the community seeks out a teacher and says this is the person who who we have selected to be our teacher of Torah, and then the decisions about the community, not alone, but the rabbi ultimately is vested with the decisions about how to interpret the Jewish tradition for that community. Is it as local as that in, within the Muslim tradition? Is it really local community by local community, or it sounds like something more regional, uh, for lack well, of a better term? Well, I would be glad to say it's very local. And we're glad to say that, you know, we, we're, very, we're very local in the decisions because when I became the imam of the, the Muslim community in Durham, uh, I mean, you know, the board of the directors of the mosque, they had their own, you know, qualifications. They, they were seeking for a specific kind of imam. And uh, they interviewed me and they, they selected me to be their teacher. So it, it depends on the, that particular community. So, 
and, and this is a good thing about the Muslim community. I don't know about the, the Jewish, but in the Muslim community in the West, we're very local. We, we don't associate with regional or organization that's international. We're very local. And that gives us, you know, the, to speak from our mind, to make decisions for the interest of our local communities. Yeah. So selecting a teacher of the Quran, again, it, it goes back to the needs of that particular community. What is the priority? What do they want to learn? And et cetera. Okay. And I think in both traditions, there is an understanding in the Jewish tradition that prophecy ended um, at the end of the at the end of the Hebrew Bible um, with with the prophet Zechariah, and that what happens afterward is an exercise in interpretation. Um, and the principles, I don't you know, I don't think it's the same thing, but the, I think that there are uh, Jewish legal principles upon which one can make decisions and not make decisions, but. Again, each community sort of figures out what is the approach to the law that we, that we want or, or do not want, um, and, and how is that reflected in, in the teacher? Yeah. Um, in, in my community, for example, you know, there is a Jewish law, and there is also an Islamic law. And in Islamic law, there are four schools of thought, that the, you know, the dominant. So in each community, you have the diversity uh, of of that aspect. You find some people would prefer to follow one particular interpretation of the law, and others would prefer to follow you know, a particular interpretation of the, of the Islamic law. What is required for the imam is to be able to know all the difference of opinions. So when someone comes to you with a question, you ask, which one do you prefer, or which one you feel more at home with? And then you give that interpretation or that, that answer. Um, I, I'm just, I want to follow up with one more question. Uh, so people ask me all the time, you know, uh, how did you decide to become a rabbi? And I joke with them. Um, my, my joking answer is there was a bright white light and a deep voice, right, that said, become a rabbi. Um, and I'm joking with them because I, that notion of immediate revelation to an individual um, really is not something that the Jewish tradition, I would say, trusts. There's a, there's a mistrust of someone who comes and says, God spoke to me. The danger of that also is that we're left very dry. There's a, the danger is that you can have a sense that, you're, that you can never trust that an experience of, of God is is one that you can open yourself up to. Um, and, and so I don't want to leave, you know, I don't want the model of, you know, the bright white light and, you know, and the deep voice saying do this or do that. But I also don't want to be, to feel sort of cut off from God, God forbid. How, how do individuals, or, you know, maybe not ask it in the theoretical way. I'm curious, how did you decide to become an imam? And, and how did you, how do you describe that sense of calling um, or, or revelation in your own individual life? Well, well you know, I, <clears throat> I decided to pursue the Islamic knowledge, not to become an imam. That was something that came later in my, in my life. But I grew up in Kenya, East Africa. And when I was young, my mother put me into elementary school. Uh, and that was a primary school that was owned by a Christian organization. But at that time, we didn't know. We thought that it was just a, a secular school and nobody was going to teach a Christian subject in, in that school. It was a private school. My, mom, uh, my mother used to pay the tuition every semester. Then at the end, when I finished the elementary, I moved to middle school. The school introduced a new subject called a CRE, which is a Christian Religious Education and it became a mandatory upon everyone. And ironically, most of the students were uh, Muslims or Somalis, refugees from Somalia to Kenya. So for me, I, you know, I, I felt that you know, I, I give a reaction that I don't even know my own religion, how come that I would you know, take another course? So I, I don't want to become a Christian anyways. That's, that is, you know, the reaction I gave at that time. And then 
At that time, I, I, I told my mom that I, I would like to study Islam. And then she put me in the Quran school. Uh, I memorized the Quran from that, you know, that led me to be who I am today. Yeah. So, you know, I, I didn't say God spoke to me. It was a reaction to it. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't claim that, you know. It was just a practical experience that I had. And in order for me to have my own Islamic faith and pursuing the Islamic knowledge, that's what led me to, to be an, an imam. So I, I want to share two things. Number one, uh, I think it's very... I also arrived, I, I'm not going to share my whole story, but um, there was a moment when I decided that I was interested in trying to understand the meaning of my life. And I had been raised Jewishly, but not uh, observant or, or really, I, I knew that I didn't know very much. And I also arrived to this, to this moment where I said, you know, I, w I, I have no reason to run away from my own tradition um, and I decided to, to go to Israel and to learn more about Judaism to sort of see, if, is this something that, that, um, pro that provides a compelling way of thinking about the meaning of my life? And so I think it's interesting, just sometimes we move away or, or we, you know, we, we say, uh, if there's something good here, I don't need, you know, I, I don't necessarily need to go to yeah, go elsewhere. Precisely, that's how I felt, that I, uh, I was a Muslim and I, I didn't want to, before I gain a deep understanding of my own faith, I didn't want to take a, a Christian course. I, in a way, I felt insecure that I, that if I take this course, I might become a Christian. So I said, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and, and so you decided that as, as a young man, yeah. but it's a decision you continue to make. Yes. Yeah, I mean, afterwards, you know, I memorized the Quran, and then I went to an Islamic high school. By the way, he's just sort of glossing over that, <laughs> to which I want to say, memorize the Quran? Like, you can... Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, so, well, I, I, I continued in the path of seeking the, the knowledge, and then, and then afterwards, I went, I, I went to an Islamic uh, college. I finished, and then... I became an imam. Yeah. Um, I, I could go on for many more, but I, I want to just give an opportunity for a couple of questions. Shula, go ahead. So I want to just repeat the question into the microphone to make sure everyone heard. Um, the, in, the, in the New Testament, uh, in fact, I think I just saw a book in the Duke uh, Divinity School, a reading of 2 Samuel um, you know, from a Christian perspective. And, and oftentimes old, what are called Old Testament texts are read as, um, as prophecies for the, for the New Testament. And Shula's question is, are there sources within either the Quran or in the Muslim tradition that, uh, that understand previous books, either in the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, as, as being predictive or prophetic uh, of, of Muhammad? Could you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> so in the, are, there, are there texts in the Hebrew Bible Right? In, in what is called the Old, uh, the Old Testament, or in the New Testament, which, which Muslims look at and say, this is what's being spoken of here is predicting um, something that happens in the Quran. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, in, first of all, you know, there is one thing we need to keep in mind is that the Quran acknowledges all the previous revelations, you know, the Torah, the Gospel, 
the books that was given to David and, and so forth. So, and also the Quran speaks about the previous revelations in a way that those revelations predicted the, 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 the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, you know, there is one specific chapter in the Quran that says those who are given the book, the previous revelations, they know about Prophet Muhammad like they know about their children. Meaning that there is a, a specific descriptions about Prophet Muhammad and uh, when he would come and, and, and the kind of person uh, he is, his character and so forth. So that aspect is, is there in the Quran. If it's there in, in, in the New Testament or the Old Testament, I don't know, I'm not a scholar of the New Testament or Old Testament, but what I can tell you is what we find in the Quran. The Quran acknowledges the previous books and also it acknowledges that those prophets and messengers, they give uh, a glad tidings to their people that there will be uh, a last messenger that would come uh, after them. So that is there in the Quran. Yeah. Um, I want to, well, Sally, go ahead. I mean, it's preferable for the imams to recite the Quran by heart, so that way they could, you know, recite the Quran as smoothly as possible. But that's not a mandatory. Someone could uh, uh, become an imam without memorizing the Quran. Leading the prayer, for example, someone could lead the prayer while holding the, the Quran, but again, it's preferable if someone recites from their heart without holding anything on your hands. So again, it's a matter of preference. Well, yeah. I, I will add um, that in terms of the leading of the prayers, for most of Jewish history, um, there were relatively, we, we have a whole, the, the bookshelves in the back are filled with what are called sidurim. A sidur is the order of Jewish prayers. And now people, um, everybody holds them and can follow along. And the person leading it also has a copy and sort of and, and recites the, the liturgy. For most of Jewish history, um, book you know it was a very rare thing to have a book. Uh, a community m might have a book, but um, oftentimes the, the skill of the prayer leader was knowing the structure of the prayer service, but actually um, being a poet and, and being able to improvise and to create. Um, ideas and prayers that on the theme of the blessing and then finishing with the blessing itself so I, I, I actually think it's to our a little bit to our poverty that that we do so much out of a book now there was I think there was this idea of of uh, of, of, of memorizing but I, I'm curious was there a sense of also improvisation not when reading the Quran but in the prayers where there's a structure, but also room for an individual to add their own voice. Yeah, the, you know, speaking about uh, the memorization of the Quran and in relations to the prayer, especially the prayer, is that when someone is leading the prayer, you know, Islamically, we believe that you are in the utmost spiritual awareness. So you put aside any, any material things. It could be a hard copy of the Quran or anything. You put everything aside and you recite whatever you memorize by heart from your heart and you concentrate on that. That is one aspect of preferring to lead the, uh, the prayer without holding the, the, the Quran. As you're speaking from uh, the other side of the, the aspect, which is the memorization of the Quran. In the Quran, there is an oral tradition again. You know, when Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, when he received the revelation, he couldn't write or read. So he was transmitting uh, the Quran to his companions through memorization. And the companions, they took the Quran from the memory of the Prophet, uh, Prophet Muhammad. And that was a legacy that we, until now, we want to continue. So it's again, a way of honoring the way the Quran was reve revealed from the beginning. So like there is a chain of narrations, like uh, for example myself, I, I have a chain of narrations that goes back to Prophet Muhammad. 
that I recited the Quran orally to my teacher. My teacher recited to his teacher all the way to the companions to Prophet Muhammad. And this is a tradition way of keeping the, 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 the dignity and the honor of the Quran in the way that was revealed. Yeah. Um, let me, um, one more question and then I have another two and then I think we're gonna wrap up because um, we don't wanna be late. Yes, Jackie, go ahead. So I'll repeat the, the question. Um, Jackie emphasized that in the Jewish tradition there is a, a, a tradition of holy questioning, um, that uh, to ask a question or to have a doubt is, um, is, is, a, is a good thing and part of, in many ways, part of the process of the way in which God, uh, God's will continues to be reveal, revealed in the world. What is the role of questioning within um, the Islamic, Islamic faith and, and, uh, and practice? Yeah. Well, in Islam, of course, you know, if, if the question is necessary, if it's legitimate, the Quran encourages you know, people to ask those kind of questions. But there is one statement from Prophet Muhammad, one time he was speaking to his companions and he said that do, do not ask excessive questions because the previous people you know, what destroyed them was asking too many questions. Uh, Wait, say that again? Say it again? I just gonna... <laughs> well, well the, the statement, you know, the Prophet Muhammad was admonishing his disciples, his companions, and asking them, he said, Be, beware of asking too many questions, because that destroyed the previous nations. Did you understand that? I did, I did. <laughs> so, the... In Islam, of course, you know, if there is no question, then how could you, you know, understand things? But again, excessive questions is what's disliked in Islam. And sometimes, you know, too many questions, it actually, you might deviate from the, the point, right, if you ask too many questions. You say that if you have too many answers, that means, no. yeah, there's, no one has the answer, right? So. But, it, but there's a concern, it, it, it sounds like there's a concern about what is the concern about excessive questions or what would make something either an unnecessary or illegitimate question? Is some, just to give you a, a practical example, one time, you know, some of the companions who accepted Islam in the, in, the, in the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad, they came to him and they asked him, what would be the destiny of my father? They were asking about the previous, their fathers and their uncles, those who died before the revelation. So they asked it like, what is the destiny of of my father and someone else asked it, what's the destiny of my mother? Is it gonna be a paradise or hellfire? And Prophet Muhammad disliked you know, these kind of questions because he doesn't know. So then God revealed a, a verse in the Quran that talks to the believers and said, do not ask excessive questions. Uh, and these questions are unnecessary questions because they died. So that means God is in charge of them. You don't have to speculate. You know? So even if there is Another story in the, in, in the Quran, there's the story of the, the, the companions of the cave. And this is a story that the Christian is also familiar with. In that story, you know, God says the previous nations, they disputed about the number of those companions. Some say three with their dogs, some say four with their dogs, five. And so God says, all of these are unnecessary speculation. Just focus on the main point. There were believers who were persecuted. Their number doesn't matter. You know, their names doesn't matter. What matters is the point. And that point was there were believers who were persecuted and their legacy was, you know, was, you know, perpetuated by the believers who came after them. Yeah. Um, so there is, a, a bracha, um, a blessing, uh, in the Jewish tradition when we experience something new. Um, it can be anything as, as small as we um, get a new piece of clothing. Um, it can be that if we taste a piece of fruit for the first time, 
um, in the season. Uh, and it's been a year since we tasted it. Before we stop and we take a moment to give thanks um, for newness to God, for the blessing of things that uh, are new. And, and the blessing acknowledges God. It says God who kept us in life and sustained us and enabled us to reach this moment, this happy moment. And, and I think that part of that blessing is acknowledging God's role in um, continuing to unfold things before us. Um, you and I have walked the sanctuary before, um, but we have not had the chance to hear your teaching, and our communities have not had the chance to meet one another. Um, and so I, I want to offer this blessing um, and invite the community to say it with me um, in the hope as we, as we offer the blessing not only for this moment, but specifically we say this blessing um, with the hope that these things will continue to return to us, um, not as the same, but in new forms and new ideas. And um, we want to say thank you to you and for your teaching. Um, I want to invite the community to say together with me, Baruch Ata Adonai Elohim Melech Avalam Shehechianu Bikimanu Bihiyanu Praised are you, Adonai, our God, who is sovereign of the universe, who has kept us all in life, who has sustained us, and enabled us to reach this moment, and we say, Amen. Amen. So I want to invite you and your community um, to the library for...